Mesdames et messieurs, je vous souhaite la bienvenue au Carnival. I'm your host, René Dupree, and uh, we're awaiting on our guest. Uh, my co-host, Jonah, is currently on the line with Ken Patera, working on the uh, technical side of things. Um, see, Ken usually has his daughter um, helping him out with, like, clicking on the links and getting set up and stuff, but he's by himself, so Jonah has to... Uh, has to help him out. So while we're waiting, um, I don't know. I can just tell you what's going on with me. I've been working on some things. Well, my bookings. So now I started taking bookings again. Uh, I still can't get into the United States, but uh, my Canadian bookings are coming in crazy. Um, I've currently taken about half a dozen already so people in the great north wrestling territory in ontario you look out for me i should be showing up september 2nd um more on that later and also fans in nova scotia and the maritimes uh there's something happening in october a really big show happening prince edward island will be next month it's next month's finally confirmed it'll be mon uh Tignish on the 21st and Montague on the 22nd. And August, I'll be returning to CCW in Fredericton. I believe it's uh, August 26th. So I'm going to start off slow, maybe uh, two or three bookings a month. And then once uh, my waiver is cleared, uh, it's off to the races because I really want to... Uh, Before I hang them up, just give it one last run or a real run on the independence in the United States. Because, I mean, I didn't really, I mean, I did maybe four or five shots a year, if that, <clears throat> in the past. But I'd like to give myself a good year of just going full throttle, you know, try to hit every state if possible. You know, that'd be really cool. Um... Okay, so Jonah should be joining us real soon. Uh, yesterday, <laughs> my friend Corey sent me a sent me a video. I guess I was featured on Steve Austin's. Uh, I don't know if it's Broken Skull Ranch or something, whatever TV show he has on A and E. Maybe the chat can help me out. But I guess I was featured on that. Uh, so that was kind of funny. It was the <clears throat> the backstage segment where um, Fifi was introduced for the first time and we're walking backstage and Sheriff was like the commissioner slash Sheriff of Raw and he gave me like a ticket <laughs> for Fifi dumping backstage. So, uh, Bash Nagata, thank you. You're going to do dungeon wrestling in Calgary. Um, I'm open to anything, actually. Um, I believe that's Bret Hart's son that promotes that federation. And I think Bret helps him out probably with the booking and stuff. So, uh, love wrestling in Alberta, Calgary, especially. So who knows? I'm open to anything. Um, yeah. So also in other news, I just got... This from James, who's still in Paris, or uh, no, he's south of Paris right now. He did the Disneyland in Paris, and now he's on a five-star resort by the ocean or whatever, and he sent me a link. That AEW Collision, its second show, was down 27% from its premiere episode, 595, so that's down... Over 220,000 from the week prior of 816. So that's that's usually how it goes. Usually, you know, this, the first week people watch just from curiosity or whatever, and then the following week goes down. So, but I mean, 595 for a Saturday night. I don't know. That's a wait and see game. From what I've been told is that uh, Tony has given Punk and 
I believe some of the, of the other wrestlers carte blanche as far as booking it. So whatever you see on that show is that's straight from his his mind. I haven't catched it yet, but I probably will. Um, still waiting on Jonah, guys. Um, Pecker AEW stinks. Um, I don't know, dude. Whatever they're doing, they're doing it right. I mean, Rogers Center in Toronto was completely sold out, right? Or at least it was full. I don't know if they sold all the tickets or if it was papered, but they were there two nights in a row. Uh, however, my friend Stacy went live and she says that the amount of people that walked out after the it was the starting of the Ring of Honor taping. The amount of people that actually walked out it was like close to, she estimated at 80%. So a lot of people didn't want to stick around to uh, watch the Ring of Honor tapings. Uh, Freaks Edge of Sanity. Hello. Came to Australia. Come to Australia so I can finally buy a hoodie. <laughs> Oh, you must be the guy that emailed me. Yeah, sorry, man. Like the shipping costs to Australia for like any type type of like clothing is crazy from Canada. Yeah, it was like three times the cost of the actual hoodie. So, yeah, I would love to go back to Australia, but I'm not flying economy. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to be 40 years of age at 6'3", 250, and 26 years of taking bumps. Flying economy for 20 some hours straight is uh, not something uh, I want to do or need to do. So, Hakata Police, thank you. You should have paid tier for extra co host. No, I think uh, I'm not going to be too greedy. Uh, I appreciate everybody that um, has subscribed to my Patreon. Um, tomorrow night, we're going to have Vaughn Lilas. He is an OVW alumni and uh, one of Rip Rogers' first students from Seymour, Indiana. He's actually uh, wrestling with Rip Rogers' uh, editor, producer, co-host. So, oh, looks like Ken Patera is with us. Here's some gimmick money. Thank you, Fixstream. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, joining us live, the one and only living legend, Former Olympian, wrestling superstar, Ken Patera. Bonjour, monsieur. Oh, we need to. Oh, hold there up your mic. Your mic. Volume. Can you hear us? No. Ken, can, you, Ken. can you hear us? Okay. We can hear you for some reason. Is it muted on your end? Is he on his laptop? No, he's on his phone. He's on his phone. Maybe try checking the volume. Put up the volume of your phone. There's usually Do you have any controls yeah. on the sides. You can. <laughs> I could read his lips. <laughs> I, <know it's> <laughs> I heard <it> much. <laughs> You look good, though. The quality is great. Yeah. If only we could hear him. I know. Do you Maybe have any headphones of any, any headphones of any kind? No? No, right? Uh, while we try to figure this out, okay. let's get to some questions. Um, yes. Hey, Renee, had you ever seen a wrestler act out after a concussion, oddly or even aggressive backstage, just as they got the concussion? I saw a clip of uh, Brock Lesnar after he did that shooting star and he landed on his head and he was flipping out. He didn't want anybody yeah. helping him. Mm. Uh, I bet you Ken probably seen some stuff in his 20-plus year career. 
getting knocked out and stuff. Still can't hear you, Ken. There's, there's no... There's no audio, yeah. No audio. Yeah. Let's see. Do you want to try messaging him? Yeah. Yeah, I'll message him. Message him, and then we'll try to... Sorry, guys, for this. I apologize, but we are trying. Um, I was really looking forward to this interview, too. We'll figure it out. Let's stay positive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll get it. Yeah, we'll get it we eventually. We'll get. It. I mean, we got him here. This is we got him on video. So we'll, just go. <laughs> we'll get it. It'd be great if we could like type subtitles or whatever. Yeah, yeah. If it's you could fun. type it in or something, you can hear us, so we can ask a question. Maybe you can type yeah. it out. <laughs> There's ways around everything. <laughs> I'm messaging now. I don't know if you're back on Messenger, Ken. I'm sending you a message. When they get to these super chats, okay. his microphone is off. I don't know because he's not on mute. It doesn't. He's not on mute. mute. It, yeah, I usually yeah. have a microphone with a line across. With the a right. thing. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Let's see. If there's any super chats we didn't get to yet. Uh. Mr. Patera, your microphone is on mute. Is off. <laughs> <laughs> How can we figure that out? What do you think it is? Um, here, let me go. Oh, Trouble. Now, now he's on mute. Oh, it's on mute. It's on mute. Yeah, I'm gonna give him a call. I'm gonna. I'll be back. Yeah. Oh, I know. You could call him. Oh, I could call him. You could yeah. call him and then just put the, the audio to the – you want to try that? I could do that. he can hear us. Yeah. Yeah, let me go. Yeah. I'll grab my phone one second. Yeah, just a second, Ken. We're, we're figuring it out. We got a plan. Ken, Jonah, Jonah's going to call you right now. He's calling you on the phone, so just – We'll put you on um, on speaker. That way there you can answer the questions. The fans can hear you. All right. Um, while we get this. Okay. Is he on? I got him on the phone. Ken? Yeah, I'm trying to get back on Facebook. I don't know. We can do it this way. This, we, we can, can do it. it we way. could do it like this. Yeah. Well, here, let me see. I uh, I got one more. Let me see. Let me Okay, I'm gonna go back on. Uh... Can you hear him, Renee? I can hear him perfect. All right, Pat, can everybody hear Ken perfectly? Here, I'm back on my computer, and I got Streamyard uh, set up. Okay. And it says uh, in the studio. Fuck! It looks like it just froze up again. That's what it was doing when we were trying to get it before. Yeah, it doesn't look like StreamYard is working right now with that. Maybe the connection's off. Yeah. Just a minute. Just a minute. Okay. Oh. Okay. Please prove me wrong. Look. You're backstage. Only the host can see you. Can you see me? Not quite uh, yet. Your device is not connected. My computer screen's all chopped up. There we go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, there we go. We got him twice. Ken, try talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hang What's up. Uh, 
We got to get you out of here. Hold on. The phone. We got to get the phone out. Okay. Hello? Yeah. You got the phone Perfect. Out? Yes. Awesome. We got it. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> it was my fucking magic. I know all about this shit. I'm just fucking with these jabronis. <laughs> How you doing, Ken? Good, good, good. good. So like I said, um, former <laughs> Olympian, uh, world, world-renowned world pro wrestler. So uh, I usually start every interview with... Um, with asking like how you broke in the business. I know you were born and raised in Minnesota, correct? No. No? I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon. Oh shit. Okay. So growing up, were you always into pro wrestling or was it just something that you fell into? Oh no, hell. We didn't even get a television set till 1953 in Portland. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I was 10 years old. Okay. But that that was uh, the TV. There was there was no TV. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, fuck. I. You have to understand that's 1953. Yeah. Okay. And uh, my uh, my parents uh, bought a television in 1953, just as the the network started to come through Portland. Uh, ABC, CBS, NBC. We didn't have anything else. Right. Oh, yeah, we did. We had a test tube. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> there was a test tube on the TV. Right. When there wasn't any uh, TV programming available. So, <laughs> because it was, it was entirely different. Yeah. Young kids like you and whoever's listening. We'll never understand that. Right. Yeah. So the first professional wrestling you were exposed to, would have that been like Don Owens out of Portland or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was Don Owens and uh, uh, his stars there were uh, Kirk Von Poppenheim and Tough Tony Bourne. Yeah. Uh, Lou Thez, not Lou Thez, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, I think Lou did come through there, though. I, I would imagine so. Yeah, so would this yeah. would this have been around the time of Gorgeous George as well? Yeah, Gorgeous okay. George uh, came through Portland Wrestling a few times, and uh, there's uh, uh, I was thinking Luther Lindsay. Wow. Uh, and uh, Art Thomas. Mm. Uh, that was Sailor Sailor Art Thomas, correct? No. No, no, no. Uh, Sailor Art Thomas was from Milwaukee. Oh, this Art Thomas out in Portland, he, he, who was that? He was a black guy too. Okay, but he was only about five seven, oh. and uh, about three hundred pounds. But he, yeah, he was no Art Thomas. <laughs> so, at what age did you find yourself like getting into pro wrestling? Was it before or after your weightlifting career? Well, I found out about wrestling the same time I found out about uh, Olympic lifting. Okay. Because uh, what first. Uh, my parents got the TV set, so we were watching pro wrestling every Saturday morning, about 9 or 10 o'clock. And uh, then uh, the 53 Olympic or the 52 Olympic Games were held in Helsinki, Finland. But because of that one year lapse, they finally got the tapes to the United States. And uh, that that's when they showed the 52 Olympic Games was in 1953. Oh. And then, uh, so here comes uh, pro wrestling. And a couple months later, here comes the Olympic Games. Okay. And uh, I was in, enthralled by the weightlifting. Mm. And uh, there was a guy by the name of Norm, Norbert Shamansky. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. 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 We got you're frozen. you. You're frozen, but we can hear you. Oh, 
Oh, what Can you hear us, Ken? Fuck. Shit. <laughs> who's, who's tapping on something? I think it, it must be him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. I don't know. That was good. Everything was going great. You want me to call him? Call him again? Call him again. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Technical difficulties. It happens. Okay. So when Jonah calls. And we will get to all your questions, folks. Don't worry about it. We'll figure this out. There's a Herb Abrams fix stream. Herb Abrams. I'm not. I'm not sure if Ken works for. He might have. He might have worked. I don't know. Was Herb into drinking or was he into snorting cocaine? A little from column A. A little from column B. Oh, shit. He's gone. Okay, so Jonah. Cocaine and hookers. No, Jonah's gone. Great. Okay, well, if anybody wants to send me a couple times in the past week or so. Right. I mean, we could totally, we could do it through the phone if you want. Yeah, let's do it through the phone. Okay. Okay. All right, we could do it through the. Do you want to join on video like you were on your phone, and we could do the volume like we were? You yeah. want to try that? Okay, cool. All right, yeah. we'll, we'll get you set up that way. Okay. Uh, you're gonna send a link then. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna send All right, I'm gonna go make myself a quick coffee. I'll be right back, Jordan. While you guys finish. Okay. This. All right, we're still here. You know, we're still live with everyone. You want to say hello, Ken? They could hear you. Okay. Let me uh can you see me? I'm getting you, hold on. Okay, can you see me? Yeah, I got you on here. Okay. But this is not my iPhone. Right. Okay, we're gonna need you though. Here, let me let me hop off this. Okay, guys and gals. While we're figuring, there, figuring this out, let's get to some. Uh, honestly, think of screen share software where someone could access his computer. Can <laughs> James see? This is what happened when James goes on vacation. Yeah. Improv. No, no, we're going to figure this out. Just be patient. Well, I'm making coffee because, quite frankly, when it comes to computer repair, uh, I don't know shit. So, <laughs> okay, so what was I talking about before all this happened? Um, yeah, yeah, the uh, collision. The collision show looks like it's already on a downward trend. Personally, I think there's just way too much wrestling on television. What do you folks think? I mean, Monday, I mean, we we do the um, the watch-alongs Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And after two, like yesterday, there was 
four matches in about two hours and 15 minutes of Raw. Four matches. And the length of the matches combined, um, being generous, was 15 minutes. I mean, I'm, I'm pushing. It was probably more like 10 or 11. So, um, let's see here. Let's get to Gerardo. Great to hear from you. Jonah, I'm having the same problem you had in New York from the fire in Canada where I'm at. How were you able to deal with it? This, uh, yeah, Montreal, man, is like uh, they were on lockdown. I talked to Sly, and he said that, yeah, the the citizens of um, the government told the citizens of Montreal to stay inside because the air quality was so poor that it was, you know, dangerous and stuff. So. Anyway, um, a great profile pick of Gerardo, yes. So um, coming up for all the Patreon members, next Wednesday, Tracy Nix is returning. And uh, yesterday we had um, Alan Funk during the watch along along with uh, A. Starling, which was hilarious. Oh, okay, so Ken's back. Ken! How you doing? Okay. Let's see. This I think this will work out. All right. We got you coming through my phone. Can you hear him, Renee? I can hear him perfect. Cool. Is that all right? Yeah, that sounds okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you were um you were last off, but you were talking about a competitor in the Olympics. I believe his name sounded like I, European. I'm trying to turn this. I, I can hardly hear you. Hello. Ken, Ken, you can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. It's because it's going through my phone. Yeah, all right. I'll you, hear. I, I hear Renee. You can't hear Renee that well. Okay. Okay. Well, Jonah, you just asked the questions. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're going to start. Jonah. We've we've got some questions for you, Ken. All right. You ready for some super chats? The fans want to know. They got a lot of stuff to ask you. Um, yeah, my, my, my goddamn computer just, just restarted. But it's uh, uh, booting. Uh, it's uh, updating. It's at nine percent. It'll be another half hour before it's full. Oh, forget the computer then. No, we got to just do this. The phone is where it's at. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Sean, can you see these questions pop up on your screen? It's good to see my childhood hero. How was life? Yeah, Sean, want to know how life is and how's life treating you? I, uh, how you work? Oh, don't ask me about McDonald's. That'll <laughs> cut the fucking uh, interview off right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, please. The McDonald's is it's I fucking... Know. Yeah, nobody... Yeah, we all know the story. And Anybody that... Uh, I'm not in the mood to be fucking around with McDonald's today. Mm. <laughs> yeah, some other time. F yeah, 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 understand. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, here we've got one from Miss Disha. Ken, what was it like working with Bobby Heenan? It was wild. Uh, Heenan was, uh, you know, he was a uh, class act. He was uh, always pulling rips, and uh, it was uh, he kept you on your toes. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, he's a guy that never graduated from high school. I don't think he ever got closer than, uh, well, I know he didn't graduate, so I think he might have been a Patrick's junior here, and then I think they picked him out once and for all. Yeah. <laughs> ask him about, um, ask him about working with, um, Ravishing Rick Rue. That's something that I want to know. Because you're both, from yeah, Minnesota. Ken, <clears throat> both from Minnesota. What was it like working with Ravishing Rick Rude? Renee was asking. What was it like working with who? Rick Rude. I never knew Rick Rude mm. uh, until he got in the business. I worked with him once over in uh, Mitchell, South Dakota. It's the only time I ever worked with him. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, but, wow. but he was a good guy. Good guy. He ran around with all the other guys from Minnesota that were in the business, like uh, the Road Warriors, uh, John Nord, uh, or uh, Scott Norton, John Nord, uh, and Kurt Hatt. Uh, yeah, they, they, they were uh, Barry Darsall, uh, who is one of the, well, he had a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, demolition. he was a demolition man. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, he wound up being, uh, uh, the repo the man, repo, the, repo man, right? Repo man. And he, he finally wound up with Bill Eadie. Uh, well, 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 over there, what was the name of that uh, group? Demolition. B- Bill Eady and Barry Darcy. Demolition. Bill Eady Demoli- was, was yeah. smashed, yeah. yeah X. And, uh, X. Oh, well, there, okay. there were a few more guys. I can't think of who they were. Let's uh, see. Out of the Mr. Well, Perfect, Kurt Henning. Yeah. So you're talking about Minnesota guys? He had Mr. I'm trying to turn this mic up, but it's, it's not working. Mm. Mm. Okay, bring up this one. All right. All right, Mr. Tara, my dad, brother, and I went to several of your rev- revised AWA cards in the late 90s. One time, I went into the ring and ran the ropes. You got on the mic and yelled at me. It was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, you got on the mic. He had a lot of balls. He's lucky I didn't strangle him. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Here's a question from Australia. All right, from Australia. It's an honor to speak with you, Mr. Patera. Thank you, Renee. Just wondering if Ken had any interesting or fun Mad Dog Vashon stories. Yeah. Mad Dog, he was always in the headlines as far as the other wrestlers were concerned. He, uh, uh, he, uh, Vern Gagne had a twin-engine Navajo airplane, beautiful plane. It sat eight people, and so they were over in North to, or no South Dakota. One one uh, evening, then they were flying back to uh, Minneapolis. Well, the Mad Dog uh, uh, received uh, a drug from uh, Adrian Adonis. It was a Quaalude. (laughs) Yeah. So, and he was drinking wine and everything. So, uh, Adrian says, Mad Dog, how you feeling? You have another one of those pills. <laughs> so Adrian gave him another quaalude. <laughs> but here's the mad dogs all fucked up now, drinking wine and popping quaaludes. And they were at about 10,000 feet. Well, the, the mad dog had to take a shit. So there's no toilet on the plane. And, uh, so he opens the door at <laughs> some feet. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> the, the, that, that's like, you know, dropping a bomb on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, especially a, a small plane. So uh, the Chicago fell out of the airplane. L- luckily, somebody had a strap around him. Yeah, I was going to say, he get, like, sucked out at that high opening the door. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, almost, he was hanging on for his life. <laughs> Somebody, uh, I think they put a seatbelt around him or something to prevent him from falling out. And then they finally landed the plane and landed on a uh, Air Force base. Well, next thing you know, here come all the cops and the military police wondering what the fuck this airplane's <laughs> landing on the airstrip at an Air Force base for. So the pilot gets out. The pilot 
uh, his regular job was uh, flying for Northwest Orient Air- Airlines. So he protocol and all that. And so <laughs> it, it, was, it, it was, it was a crazy story, but it was very dangerous. No, and, definitely. Uh, they're lucky that plane didn't go down. Yeah. And, uh, oh. Seriously. But, uh, other than the pilot landing. But, uh, so that, that was a, a mad dog story. That's a great mad dog story. Um, yeah. We have another question here. Forget Andre drinking. What about Herb Abrams? What about Herb? Yeah, Herb Abrams. Any drinking stories of Herb Abrams? Or any stories in general? Any, yeah, any stories at all? Yeah. I'm from New Zealand. No, no, he was the the Jewish promoter from uh, I believe New York City. He tried to run against Vince. From where? From New York City. Yeah. What? It, wait. What was it again? His promotion. Uh, that he tried to start Ultimate Wrestling Federation UWF. Oh, yeah. oh UW. Oh yeah, yeah UWF. Yeah. I, I remember him the first time I met him. He was so high on cocaine. <laughs> That's what I heard about you. Yeah. What he was doing, or uh, he ran that. Uh, I did three shows out in Los Angeles, and. Uh, then uh, he got all strung out on cocaine. He wound up dying. Isn't there a mystery about that or something? <laughs> they don't know if he's dead or not. There's like a conspiracy yeah. about him. Yeah, nobody knows. He just disappeared. I really don't know too much about her, her except he took all his money and pumped it into this wrestling promotion. And he's he was uh, going after Vince McMahon. Well, but he didn't know anything about the wrestling business. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was all, you know, all bullshit. Uh, and so I did three shows for him, and I, I saw that that ship was going to sink. <laughs> and uh, so I, 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 I bailed out. I jumped ship. <laughs> did you ever have an issue with pay? Did you always get paid? Did you have an issue with pay? No, okay. no, not at all. He paid me. Uh, I think I was doing uh, uh, these shows. This is back in the nineties, long, long time ago. I, 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 I was doing each show for for a thousand dollars. He paid me cash up front uh, all three times. Yes, okay. but I, I, I guess later on he ran out of money. And he's still trying to run these shows, but he wasn't drawing anything. Right. So he didn't have any money busted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, we've got. No, no. We've just, got fixed back, Rick. I don't think. Yeah. Oh. We'll uh, one. One, but which manager did you enjoy working with the most? and Bobby Hayden. Or, 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 when I wrestled down in Texas and Louisiana, I had J.J. Dillon. Oh. So I, I had four different managers. Uh, hell, they were all good. Yeah, J.J. Dillon and Bobby and uh, Lou Albano and yeah. uh, the Grand Wizard. Probably the Grand Wizard. That would be your favorite, uh, yeah? Huh? Yeah, the Grand Wizard, you'd say, would be your favorite manager of all those. There's so many legends you just named, yeah. yeah I think so. Yeah, Bobby was super. I, I, I'd say uh, Bobby Hayden and the Grand Wizard were my two uh, favorite uh, managers. Mm, mm. I got a question. Like, uh, Ken, can you hear me? Barely. Barely? Okay, I'll try to talk louder. So when you were training with Vern Gagne, you were there with Ric Flair, correct? Yeah. Okay, and 
I remember I, I heard some stories that like he wanted to quit, but you're the one that motivated him to get back into the into the ring. Uh, Rick Flair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rick and I were living together. Right. And I I, I got burned into the the wrestling camp. Uh, uh, burn guy. Yeah, he already had five guys. He had me. His son, Greg Gagne, Tim Brunzel, a kid from Minnesota, Bobby Bruckner, he was a pro football player, and the Iron Sheik. Yeah. And uh, so that was the five of them. And so Vern didn't think that he needed a six. I, so I went to Vern, I said, Vern, we need a six person, you know, and the, the, they'll be, that way we can pair up and everything. Uh, I had already mentioned Ric Flair to him, and uh, so uh, reluctantly, he <laughs> says, well, okay, I, I talked to your son, Greg, and Jimmy Brunzel, they know Rick from the University of Minnesota. They were all in uh, class over there together, Yeah, before Rick got kicked out, and... Uh, <laughs> What did he get kicked out for? for? Wild, man. I'll tell you yeah, oh, yeah, why did he get kicked out? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I think he flunked out. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, Rick wasn't much of a student. <laughs> but he, he's probably smarter than all those guys. Right. He, right. he just got, uh, he had no discipline. Okay. Yeah. So, with uh, with the Iron Sheik just passing, do you have any memories with him? Any good stories? Oh God, yeah, a thousand. Uh, when uh, about a year, year and a half after we all started in 1973, we all basically started in 1973 in January, and. Uh, but, yeah, once we left the AWA, we all went our own way. And so, anyway, we wound up doing a show something. And I says, Cosro, I said, uh, you've been there. Tonight. Is that good? I said, yeah, you're an all-American boy now. <laughs> when I first met you at training camp. You didn't smoke, you didn't drink, you didn't uh, fuck girls, you didn't do shit. <laughs> and I said, now, now you're smoking marijuana, you're doing other drugs, you're drinking Heineken beer, and you're fucking all these uh, ring rats. I said, that makes you an all-American boy now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, he loved it. The character. Yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. Hey, Ken, what are your yeah. thoughts on current IC champion Gunther? Also, money in the bank predictions. Ken, do you still watch? Do you watch wrestling today? <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to this computer came back online uh, do I watch, watch wrestling? yeah like today's stuff not not too much I caught a glimpse of uh, the last uh, Wrestlemania Oh yeah, and uh, that that was pretty good. Uh, the, the girls, the way they did the girls, though, that was atrocious. Uh, it was terrible. What in but, which uh, in what in what match? Do you know which one specifically you're talking about? Do you remember? Well, the girls did. Did they have like a battle royal or something? Did they were all in the ring at the same time. Oh, they had the showcase matches, I think, this year. Yeah, it was like eight of them, eight, eight in the ring at the same time. I remember people not, not loving that match, yeah. That's horrible. 
Yeah. But uh, anything stand out that you liked from the from WrestleMania? Anybody? Um. God, I'm trying to think. Uh, who did Cody uh, work with? Woman Reigns. That wasn't too bad. Yeah, that, that, that was pretty good. It's a big match, yeah. A lot of excitement for that one. As, it's cool as you know, catch it. Of, what do you think of the modern style with, you know, I'm so many high I'm trying to get my computer back on it. Oh, yeah. It got reloaded quicker than what I thought. While it's loading, hey, Ken, what do you think of the current style of wrestling, the more modern day style with a lot of the high spots in a lot of those matches I'm sure you saw? Oh, it's, it's a hit. <laughs> Fuck, it, you know, not, not, I, I don't know. Uh, if it wasn't for the promotion, um, you know, put guys over, it'd be terrible. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, see if I can uh, carry on top of this music. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, some guys still know how to work, but most of them don't. And it's all high spots. And uh, when nobody knows how to sell, it, it gets uh, very boring. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Let's see. Okay, uh, we, we got, got that one. Bash Gata wants to know, uh, Mr. Patera, it's been 50 years since you were trained by Vern Gagne. Any fun stories about all the people you trained with? How brutal was it? Yeah, how brutal was the training? It was brutal. Uh, it was, uh, you know, he had his camp in the middle of winter, not, not in the middle of winter, but the... Uh, I, I, I'm gonna get back in the studio on my oh, here you uh, come. computer. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's dead. I don't know what the hell the matter with it. It says Renee and then Jonah. Oh, there you are. Okay. Can you Can see me you on the computer now? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, let's go to the computer. All right. We're here. Okay. Can you hear me? Beautiful. Yes. yes. Nice. Okay. Oh, determined. Really? That was determination. Yeah, we're happy to have you on the computer. Yeah, a great we were shot. Talk, we were talking about the conditions of Vern's um, training camp. You said it was in the middle of the winter or – well, we started, uh, I got back from the Olympic Games, which were in Munich, Germany that year, uh, in uh, the uh, end of September. And uh, so when I got back, uh, Vern was still in Italy with his family. He, he brought his whole family over to Germany to watch me compete. Wow. Wow. Uh, I don't know if they watched me, you know, there was a thousand other things to do. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, when Vern got back from Italy, which is about a week after I got back, uh, he got uh, uh, Billy Robinson uh, uh, confirmed to coach us. And so uh, when he, uh, God damn it. Is this ridiculous? No, we hear you. No, we can hear you perfect. And, okay, and you're you moving. Just... You're good. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay. Can, can you see me, though? Yeah. Yeah. Everything is A1. Oh, okay, I, I can't see anything. Uh, okay. but, but, but anyway, uh, when Vern got back, oh, here we go. Let's see. Yeah, Can you see me now? 
Yeah, everything's running perfect, man. Okay. Yep. Except except this piece of shit computer of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Anyway, <laughs> when uh, Vern got back from uh, Italy, mm. he uh, after the Olympics were over, he took his uh, uh, wife and two daughters, or three, yeah, two daughters, down to Italy. Uh, his youngest daughter, uh, Beth, she didn't want to come. So she stayed in Minnesota. Uh, Greg and I went over to uh, Vienna, Austria, and then over to uh, Bratislava, uh, Czechoslovakia, and uh, toured all over there, you know, and then we came back. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, Vern... Uh, had his training camp set up out at one of his barns. Mm, and now yeah. you have to understand, this is an old barn built uh, in like uh, 1901. So Shit. this fucking barn was already 70 years old. Wow. <laughs> and he had horses down below. And so they, uh, he had a caretaker for the farm and the horses. Well, the horses are down there shitting. The, the fucking horrible odor. Right. Chickens running all over the place. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I'll give you an idea. We show up at the barn at 9 o'clock in the morning. The chickens are roosting up above the wrestling ring. Well, what do a, what a chickens do? They, they shit. shit. Right. So they shit all over that fucking ring. Oh, God. All over the canvas. We had to sweep <laughs> that goddamn canvas out every morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I mean, we had one light bulb in the place that was dangling from a wire. One, one like a 40 watt light bulb for this huge farm or barn. Right. And so we're in there. And so Billy Robinson gets us outside the ring on the barn floor. And we're doing free squats. And uh, we started with uh, 50, three sets of 50 free squats. Well, within two weeks, we were doing three sets of 500 wow. free squats. Now, this is before we do anything in the wrestling ring. Wow. We're doing these free squats. We're doing calisthenics. We're doing stretching, this and that. And we're doing pummeling with each other. That's an amateur yep. type of uh, warm-up. And uh, then... Uh, once we're all nice and warmed up and sweating, we jump in the ring and we start off giving each other beals. Well, now there's six of us. So that means you give six beals and you take six beals. <laughs> yeah. And then arm drags, uh, uh, six arm drags, each one. Uh, then, uh, uh, you, you know, take a headlock, throw a guy in, you do a drop toll. Okay. Six of those. And then, uh, you know, take a headlock, throw the guy in, comes off, gives you a tackle. Six of those. Well, next thing you know, we went through all the regular uh, routines. It was like 50 fucking uh, moves. Right. And that took about two, three hours. And then, uh, so we we were just doing the basics the first yeah. week, first yeah. week and a half, I think. And uh, then, then we learned to tie up. And uh, I remember uh, Rick Flair and I, we tie up. I throw him off. He comes off the rope to give me a tackle. Boom. We smack our heads together. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Rick weighed about 280. I weighed, I think, 315. Wow. Yeah, because you know, I just got out of the Olympic Games. Wow, 315. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. yeah. 
Can you hear us? Shit, you can't hear us. Oh, no. Hello? 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 Yes. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Everything's perfect. Well, well, Flair and I, we headbutt each other. Damn near knocked ourselves out. And uh, so I said, Rick, put your head on the on my left shoulder when we do these. Yeah, he was coming straight off. Right. And uh, I, I didn't have a chance to adjust or move or anything. Boom. And uh, so, you know, little things like that. We beat each other up so on everything. Yeah, we were, you know, throw throw the guy in, run in and give him a a monkey flip. Uh, then, then we were doing the fireman's carries. We were doing everything. We were doing like 50, maybe, maybe 60, 70 uh, moves uh, per training session. Mm. And like I said, it takes two, two and a half, maybe three hours to right. do all that stuff. And since we're still learning how to do uh, most of it, I mean, we're, ah, oh, talk about uh, concussions and uh, shoulder injuries, back injuries, neck injuries. And uh, we, we were just getting started. <laughs> right. right. So, yeah, it, it was, it was hectic. Yeah. Uh, so here we we've go. Got yeah, we got one. Please do not make fun of Jim Cornette. Plus, Jota, duty 12 beer guys in the chat. Terrible attempt to troll him. I'd have to take up a case. Look, the chat was just having a good time, it looks like. Oh, um, okay. As we were doing tech support here, yeah. Uh, uh, did, but, did you ever have any dealings with Jim Cornette? He's he's like a polarizing figure in wrestling. Did you ever? Yeah, uh, I, I did. When, uh, when I was wrestling here in the AWA for the second time, which okay. would have been uh, around 83 or 84, I'd uh, fly down uh, to Memphis and uh, wrestle in the Mid-South Coliseum with Jerry Lawler. Okay. Yeah. I think he flew me down there four or five times, maybe six times. Wow. And we, we had sellouts every time I wrestled Jerry in the Mid-South Coliseum. Yeah, that was a hot so, territory, right? Oh, yeah, it was hot. So, so of all the territories, if you don't mind me asking, all the territories you've been before you went to WWF, like which one would you consider the best? Was it Vern? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, Vern, Vern, Vern was number one. Right. Yeah, and then, of course, I went to uh, Crockett Promotions there in uh, Mid-Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, made a lot of money there. And... uh then I worked for Bill Watts when he so. was uh, finally getting up and running in the Oklahoma Territory, which consists of Oklahoma, Louisiana, um, Arkansas, Mississippi. And uh, yeah, so uh, I made my rounds. Yeah, but yeah. I, I was main event everywhere I went. And uh so uh, I made top money, you know, I, I was never, the only place I didn't make top money because the territory was dead was Atlanta and uh, in 81. So I Atlanta up. was uh, Ole Anderson booking at that time? No, no. Uh, Ole and Gene didn't, uh, well, they, they had just finished. Oh. They had left about six months before I got there. They, they had blood every fucking match, opening match to the main event, six, seven, eight matches, all juiced. Oh, fuck. Overkill. Said, well, no wonder the goddamn territory's dead. The only <laughs> guy that was still there was uh, Tommy Rich. Okay. And uh, I think wrestling number two, Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we were... Uh, we had the Omni, of course. That's the only place you can make any money. But hell, we were still only drawing 10, 12,000 people in the Omni. You know, and then finally, I was there for four months. 
we finally built it up to about, you know, close to 20,000. Wow. God damn it. Can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can see and hear you perfect. Yeah. So once we got Atlanta back up and running, after I was there for four months. They brought George Scott in to do the booking. Okay. Well, I like George Scott. As a matter of fact, I bought his house when I was wrestling in uh, Charlotte, you know, oh. Mid Atlantic for Crockett. Right. Beautiful house. But anyway, uh, uh, so George comes. I didn't like him as a booker, though. Okay. And uh, he came in. I had the Georgia championship belt. Right. And uh, so, and I was working a program with uh, Tommy Rich, and we were just getting it hot, just get starting to draw money. A fucking George comes in and says, Ken, I want you to drop the belt to Tommy uh, tonight in the Omni, biggest crowd we had since I had been there. And I said, Well, then what? Well, right. then I'm going to have Tommy drop it to uh, Bill, Bill Leedy. He had just flown back from Japan that night. So he was working as the mass superstar at that point? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I says, well, okay. I looked at Tommy. I said, Tommy, I told you this was going to happen. As soon as George Scott got here, he was there less than a week. I, and I said, what did I tell you I was going to do? Well, you said that you weren't going to work for him. I said, you're right. So I, I took the belt out of my bag, threw it on the floor. I said, there's your fucking Georgia championship belt, George Scott. And I left. I went out the back door. <laughs> wow. Well, hold on. Because when Vince McMahon first started, he had brought in George Scott as the booker, correct? Do I now? Vince McMahon, like when WWE, like the first WrestleMania, wasn't it George Scott booking for Vince? I, yeah, I, I think it was. Yeah. And then, like, he, he left shortly after, and I think he put Pat Patterson in there. Is that how it worked out? Well, I, I won the Intercontinental belt from Patterson in 81. Oh, okay. And then, uh, so then I, I finished, then I dropped it to uh, Pedro Morales, I think yeah. in October, November. Right. Because I, I, I wanted to go on my own. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I, I talked to Vin, Vince's dad and I, I uh, told him that uh, I wanted to finish up. And uh, George Scott had just come in. Hmm. Yeah, about uh, October, November, something like that. And I told the old man, I said, I can't work with this motherfucker. <laughs> and he said, well, what's the problem? I said, well, it goes way back. Uh, and so I left. Okay. And uh, and I, I told him, I said, I, I'd like to come back uh, on my own terms, though. And he said, that's fine. That's fine. So I went to Atlanta and uh, I was working uh, independent. I was working in Houston. I was working St. Louis. I was working Montreal. I was working Toronto. I was w working for all the independent promoters. Yeah. At that time. Yeah. And uh, plus uh, Atlanta. Yeah. And so when I left Atlanta, I kept doing that. And then I bumped into uh, Vern Gagne down in St. Louis. Okay. And uh, I says, well, I said, uh, how's your territory doing, Vern? He says, oh, we're, we're doing box office. I, I said, I heard, heard that you're doing real well. I said, uh, I'd like to come back. He says, really? He says, shit, we'd love to have you. So he says, when can you start? I said, well, I'm still living in Atlanta and my wife's down there. She's pregnant. So I'm going to have to go box up all my uh, 
stuff and uh, get everything up to Minneapolis and find a place to live. Mm. And he says, shit. No, you're perfect. You're perfect. We hear, you. we hear you. Yeah. He said, okay, well, as soon as you can get up there, let me know. So it was like two weeks um, or maybe three weeks at the most. And I told him that I would still like to work um, for Paul Bosch down in Houston and um, Sam Mushnick over in St. Louis, Frank Tunney up in Toronto and blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I keep doing what I'm doing. Mm. He says, yeah. I, I said, I talked to Jerry Lawler down in Memphis. He said, I have no problem with that as long as it doesn't interfere with your bookings uh, with me. See, Vern uh, didn't run shows on Mondays. Okay. So that worked out perfect. Because that was, that was uh, the, mid, mid, uh, the Memphis big show was on Monday, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Right. And so, and uh, uh, Vern only ran 15, 16, maybe 17 shows a month. So we had two weeks off. And uh, didn't he take off like six weeks off in the spring, like May, June, he would take off? Yeah, for the summer. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So we had a lot. I mean, we were doing 120, 130,000 a year. Up here, and, you know, back in those days, that was a ton of money. Especially, yeah, in the '80s, if you compare it to today, that'd be like three hundred thousand or close to it. No, five hundred. Fuck. Yeah, five hundred thousand. Yeah. Fuck. Okay. Yeah. Here's this, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Ask this question, Jonah. Yeah. Ken, right when, what's your, your when you oh, figure? Yeah, when you figure in the travel, living expenses, road expense, and everything, back in those days, it was next next to nothing. You buy a, gor <laughs> I, I a gorgeous house up here for $106,000. <laughs> it was gorgeous. That fucking house uh, sold for eight, 850000 not too long ago. You know, Can you so yeah. Can you see this question on the screen? It, it goes back to what you were saying before of um, like what the what you thought of WrestleMania. This person wants to know what's your opinion on female wrestlers. Well, when when I was in the business, the female wrestlers were tough, mm -hmm. and they were good looking. I know that because I fucked most of them, <laughs> and uh, but that was just part of the. Uh, uh, road, you know. Right. So, um, is this a family oriented show? <laughs> no, not even oh. a little bit. Okay, no. I was gonna say I better watch my mouth. That'd be the last oh. thing I'd use to describe this show. <laughs> yeah, it's too late now. Uh, but yeah, uh, the girls were tough, and they uh, they were no nonsense. They liked to go out with us. And, yeah, pound the whiskey and the beer. And, uh, yeah. shit, they were we were just part of the the routine. But then, uh, you know, of course, then twenty years later, when McMahon gets all these uh, girls in from uh, booking agencies and modeling agencies, and yeah, you know, but most of these girls they don't know what the hell they're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, no, no matter how much you, you teach them, here, just a minute. Ah. No matter how much you teach them, they're not athletic. You know, the ma majority of them. And uh, so then they have to weed those all out. Then the ones that they keep are athletic, of course. But uh, right. it, it's not like uh, the girls back in back in the day, you know. And, Tougher, uh, you think back then, yeah. Yeah. So it was uh, one of those one of those deals. 
I think you answered this earlier, but it was since we had tech issues. We'll ask again. Any thoughts on Rick Rude? I know you said you only had one real interaction with him. Yeah, I only worked with Rick one time over in uh... – fuck. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, we got you. Hello? What's your thoughts? What's your thoughts on the rumored way of his passing? I mean, that's, I mean, you know, wrestling and rumors like the he had injected the uh, Viagra, whatever. Okay, we are back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the rumors of him taking his own life was like a like a a suicide by overdose. What's your thoughts on that? It's tragic, really. He was so young; he was only forty. Well, it's all those guys. Kurt Henning. Yeah. The same way. Cocaine and uh, barbiturates and uh, Jack Daniels. Now, yeah. of course, they were all pumped full of steroids. Uh, the steroids was the least lethal thing they had in their bodies. And, uh, but, you know, they took so much. Jesus Christ. You know, when I was an athlete, steroids were legal right and so we really didn't know uh, uh, you know the uh, bad side side effects of steroids so we we didn't take very many we took a, the minimal amount that the doctor would prescribe right. which was minuscule it was nothing and uh, I would take them three times a year for six weeks. Then I would, I wouldn't take them. Clean yourself out, yeah. Yeah. And I walk into a locker room on Long Island at the NASCAR Call of Sam. I was getting ready yeah. to retire. Yeah. Well, a couple months before I retired. I mean, we had uh, Ricky McGraw, Dynamite Kid, Davy Boy Smith. Ultimate Warrior, Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Uh, I can rattle these names off because they're all dead. Yeah. And uh, I told those guys, I said, what you guys just pumped in your ass was more than I would take in six months. Wow. <laughs> they, they have three syringes each, three cc's of the strongest steroid uh, that you could buy. So they would and inject I, three, three, three cc needles yeah, not, at once. Total of nine ccs at one time. Jesus Christ! Yeah, and that's not counting the orals. They were taking uh, oral, like Debo, I never heard of Anadrols and all this other stuff. Yeah, wow. because you know, you know, I finished up in 1972. From taking yeah. steroids and now it's 1987 1988 yeah i mean that's a long that's a decade decade right. later i didn't even know what the hell they were injecting right and uh then you know i, I found out in a hurry you know <laughs> then you know they you know brutus the barber would tell me they were taking things like winstrel v yeah and veterinary that's for horses. Yeah, equipoise. They were that shit in, in their bodies. Equipoise was another. All kinds of stuff. I said, what the fuck? Yeah. I, I could not. I, I, and then, you know, when they all started dropping over dead, yeah. you know, from heart attacks, well, then I find out, well, all it wasn't the, just the steroids. There's a, enormous amounts of cocaine. And barbiturates, you know, sleeping muscle relaxers. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, speed, you know, like, uh, oh, God, I can't even think of the names of them. Uh, like ephedrine and stuff like that? Yeah, I guess the stuff I never even knew of. You know, right. I, I never took any of that stuff. So I, I, I drank my beer and some whiskey once in a while. And that was it. That was it. Yeah. So like now, now it seems like the, 
WWE especially has cleaned up. Do you, do you believe that? Like as far as like performance enhancing drugs and stuff? No. By looking by looking at the physiques. No. You don't think so? No, they still take juice. They just uh, don't take as much. Right. You know, like uh, uh, when Brock Lesnar. Oh uh, shit. <clears throat> when he he went to the MMA. Uh, uh, the UFC. Oh, is that what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he had that match, and then um, he had tested yeah. positive or whatever, right? Yeah, he tested positive two or three times. Yeah. And so I'm, you know. So the deal. So this is the deal with him because he didn't sign a full time contract with WWE, he's like just a part timer. He's not under the same rules as the rest of the crew. So oh, that might have been. Yeah, yeah, so he's allowed to take whatever the fuck he wants, basically. Yeah. 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 I like Brock, but, you know, Brock isn't a naturally big guy. You know, if, if he wasn't jacked up on the roids and stuff. Really? He'd be maybe 230, 220. Right. Yeah. You know. So, uh, but I, I like Brock. He's a good guy. Uh, my Hello, buddy Legend. Brad Reagan's uh, broke him in. Brad Reagan's, right? Minnesota, yeah. Yeah, I, I went out to their training camp in 99. God, that's 24 years ago. I, oh, I met so, you, so that's where you first saw him? Okay. Yeah, in 99 out at uh, uh, Brad's house. Brad had a swimming pool. Right. That he layered over with concrete. <laughs> But it, it was an indoor swimming pool. Okay. So it was a nice, nice area. Uh, Brad set up a wrestling ring in there and uh, trained the wrestlers, you know, the ones that were in his camp at that time. I, I know the Japanese were sending him uh, talent to, to train. And uh, then, uh, uh, God, what was his name? Uh, uh, the, he had three or four MMA guys. Oh shit! Was um, uh, Don Fry? Did Don Fry yeah. train with you? Yeah, Don Fry was there that day. Maybe Mark Coleman, possibly. No, Mark might might Mark might have been there. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of the yeah a lot of the um. New Japan would use a lot of, especially when Inoki was still there, they would uh, use a lot of uh, MMA MMA yeah. fighters. Yeah, I remember meeting Don Fry, and uh, uh, then Brock was there. He was uh, uh, just breaking in. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, that, that, Brad, he was the type of guy that could control that type of uh, mentality. Right. Yeah, you know, Brad was a tough motherfucker. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was my tag team partner. Okay. We, were, we called ourselves the Olympians. And, oh, was he in the Olympics too? Uh, no, he. Well, he would have been, but uh, they canceled. Jimmy Carter canceled the 1980 Olympics. Oh. Uh, because okay. Russia had. Uh, uh, Invaded uh, Afghanistan. Okay, so then yeah, Jimmy so, uh, that left uh, Brad and all the rest of the potential Olympic uh, people out of it. But yeah, Brad would have won a gold medal. He, he won the like, world championship wow. in the two twenty pound class the previous two years uh, uh, before going. Uh, uh, 1980 so he he won the championship the world championship in 78 and 79 and so and that, that's just like the olympics right but uh, of course uh it's not treated the same mm. so who did you look up to wrestling wise like any influences in wrestling Oh yeah, uh, Bruno. Bruno. Bruno Sammartino uh, was always kind of an idol of mine. You know, when 
I was growing up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, uh, when I was in high school and college, and you know, I we'd get the wrestling magazines and stuff, and so yeah, Bruno, and uh, then then what I I got a hold of Bruno through uh, Larry Zabisco. Okay. Uh, when, when we were down in uh, Charlotte, down in Mid Atlantic for the Crockets. Yeah. We can see you, bud. You're there. Yeah. For, oh, uh, I know what it is. I don't know what it is. It's, it's a screensaver, right? Yeah. Like, so yeah. We, okay. That's what it is. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, Larry, uh, he lived down the street from Bruno in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so he uh, gave me Bruno's phone number. I called Bruno and I told him that I'd like to come uh, to uh, the WWWF and work with him. And he, you know, he said, God, that makes me feel good, Ken. He <laughs> says, you know, I've been a big fan of yours. I know all about your, uh, your Olympic lifting and the Pan American Games, Olympic Games. I know about when you were at Brigham Young University, you were a shot putter out there. You won the national championship in the shot put. And he says, yeah, he said, I'd love to have you up here. So that was a no brainer. Boom. Yeah. You know, so when I finished up, I was doing a program with Johnny Valentine down in uh, uh, Crockett promotions. And, uh, God, I'll tell you the truth. I really hated to leave. We were selling out everywhere. <laughs> God, we were really making good money. And, uh, but I was making 50000 a year more by going yeah. up to New York. Mm -hmm. Wow. And 50000 a year, that was a big deal. Fucking right. Big deal so, now. Yeah. Was... <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyway. Ken. Oh. Go ahead. Wahoo McDaniel, you got to <laughs> have stories, man. Oh, God, Wahoo. I met Wahoo in 1960 when I was a junior in high school. Yeah. And he was uh, right out of uh, Oklahoma, all-American football player. He got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. Fuck. And my big brother, Jack Patera, was the middle linebacker. Uh, at that time. And so uh, Wahoo was a rookie and he made it through the first three. If you make all three cuts, you know, when you're trying out for a pro football team, then you're on the team. Wahoo got cut on the third cut. Oh, shit. So, yeah. So he's out. So who's he get picked up by? I, I'm not sure you who. Remember? I don't know. The Sorry. New York Jets. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So now he's playing at Shea Stadium. <laughs> Every time Wahoo made a tackle, the 50,000 people that were in that play, they'd go, Wahoo, Wahoo, Wahoo. <laughs> yeah, so well, he got I, over. I just have one question as a worker. How, how stiff were his chops? He was stiff. He was he'd stiff. Split, he split you open. Yeah, with his chops. Boom. Oh, yeah. Uh, he split me open twice, I think. But the, the, the guy said he really split open was Ric Flair and Johnny Valentine. Oh. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah so they, they had little feuds going back and forth. Right. And uh, I didn't work with Wahoo that much. I worked with Johnny Valentine, a little bit with Ric Flair, and a uh, little bit with Wahoo, but so that's uh, where Flair got his, his chops, right? Was working with Wahoo. Yeah. 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 So that's really that cool. was funny. Yeah. I met Wahoo in 1960, and here we are again. Uh, you know, 19, 1968, 69. Uh, when I was down, and then I was. I was in the WWF kind of pancake between the, those two uh, situations. Yeah. Okay. 
So well, this yeah, is I, I worked with all the top guys. Mm. And all the top guys got to work with Ken Patera. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that went to the fucking Olympic Games. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, Captain Lou Albano, you talked about earlier, and teaming up with Jerry Blackwell. Getting good stories. Oh, yeah. Jerry, you know, Jerry couldn't read or write. He was illiterate. Yeah. Okay. But he's one of the smartest guys I ever uh, knew. Sometimes you don't need it. Yeah. Right. So he was like street smart? Yeah. He, he he grew up in a little town, Cummins, Georgia. And uh, I guess nobody down there in Georgia at that time went past the eighth grade. And okay. uh, Jerry, I asked Jerry, I said, Jerry, how much education did you get? He said, well, I, I, I dropped out when I was in the eighth grade. I said, oh, he said, everybody did. Right. I said, well, there must have been a few that stayed in. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So but, Captain Lou, he was notorious for his drinking, right? So, oh, God. Uh, I'll, so tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about Lou. Okay. I'm talking to, I had just left North Carolina uh, and uh, I was working a program with Jerry Blackwell. Okay. Well, Jerry talked about uh, moonshine all the time. And I guess he had an uncle or a cousin that made moon, moonshine, legitimate moonshine <laughs> down in Georgia. So I told Lou, when I went back to New York, that's when Lou was my first uh, uh, my first manager in the WWF. And so uh, I think uh, I was we were up there about three, four months. Lou was fucked up every TV. We did TV every three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Never draw a sober breath. Right. <laughs> so I, uh, Lou, you like moonshine? Well, I, I never had real moonshine. I said, I have a friend down in Georgia that can get you real moonshine. Really? I said, yeah. I said, I won't even charge you. I'll buy it. So I asked Jerry how much he uh, got that stuff. They had uh, one quart mason jars. That's what yeah. they put this stuff in. Yeah. And he says, uh, $8, I think. I said, okay, I'll give you 10 Get me two, uh, two quarts. So uh, I go back up to New York after like three days off. And I give uh, Lou uh, a quart of that moonshine. I, I kept a quart for my house you know yeah that stuff was like 110 120 Fuck. Proof. yeah <laughs> yeah it'll blind you yeah, i think well, that. you, you <laughs> dip a potato chip in the stuff and put a match to it <laughs> it says on fire yeah okay so how long did it take lou to drink that fucking thing he drank the whole fucking bottle. No. Swear to God, in about three hours. <laughs> this, this is yeah. This is during the summertime at, at the Fourth Street Arena down there in uh, Philadelphia. Holy shit! And it was like July or August. It was hotter than hell. It was so hot. The floor, the concrete floors were sweaty. Right, right. That's how hot it is. Yeah. So. Lose, you know, after about half of that court, he's off. He's feeling his fucking oats now. Right. So he's out there fucking running around the locker room, bare ass naked. <laughs> he runs in the shower. And, uh, well, you couldn't run on that floor because it was just slick as ice. Yeah. So he slides into the shower, takes a shower. It's only about two, three o'clock in the afternoon. He comes out. 
he's drying off, and then then he tries to get to his clothes. So he takes about three steps, boom, slide. His feet go up over his head, and he comes crashing down, bangs his head on the concrete floor. I thought he had killed himself. I said, fuck. Wow. And just at, at that time, old man McMahon comes in the locker room, sees Lou laid out, sprawled out on the floor. Naked. Yeah. Fuck. Well, let's talk about Vince McMahon Sr. Like the stories that I hear, he's like, the, he was the exact opposite of his son. Like everyone loved Vince Sr., right? Oh, yeah. He was a real dip, diplomat. Right. Yeah, I love the guy. Yeah, his, his kid, now, Junior, the guy that runs it now, him and I used to go up and down the East Coast uh, driving all the time. He had a big blue uh, uh, Lincoln. And if I didn't drive, he drove. Oh. So one day we take off from New York. We go all the way up to uh, Bangor, Maine. Uh -huh. I mean, that's like driving to the end of the world. <laughs> right. And uh, he said, he's telling me all the, what's going on, you know, on the way up. He said, we used to run Bangor, but we haven't run it for several years now. He said, my dad has given me permission to open up, uh, uh, you know, Connecticut and uh, some small towns in Massachusetts uh, and Portland, Maine. And I said, okay. Uh, and so we get up there and uh, we, get, we get into town and it was lunchtime. It was just beautiful area, a nice ocean uh, um, docks and everything, you know. And there's this seafood restaurant uh, on one of the docks uh, there in Bangor, Maine. So we pull in there, we get out, we get in. We order uh, seafood platters, big mm. fucking platters. I'm thinking they were like that. Mm. Just fucking food, unbelievable. Six bucks. Shit. Yeah, that, that, that plate, I don't even know if they serve you a platter that big anymore. Not down. And they charge you 75 bucks for it. Yeah. You might be able to get two shrimp for six bucks now. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, right. we're sitting there at the table and they bring us our food. I wanted mine broiled. He wanted his fried. The, the same food, though. So Vince he eating fried food? food? Shit. Huh? I said Vince McMahon eating fried food? Yeah. Wow. Back then. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So he asked the waitress for ketchup. Yeah, I heard yeah. he loves ketchup. Loves she ketchup. Go, she goes and gets a bottle of ketchup. He dumped half of that bottle of ketchup on that fucking fried seafood. Plus, I said, so you're going to have some seafood with your ketchup, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I, I said, you just fucking destroyed the whole platter. Right. Nah, 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 I love, I love ketchup. Ketchup. He That's what Pat Patterson, Pat Patterson would tell me, that Vince loves ketchup. You, the yeah. Wow. Food in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. He'd order a big fucking hundred dollar steak and bury it in ketchup. Fuck. Yeah, you know, he was addicted to ketchup. Yeah. And, um, uh, it's a, that's a good clip. Here's a question. Well, this is a question about Stephanie McMahon. Did you ever spend any time around Shane or Stephanie, the kids? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. You know, not 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 much. They they were still six and nine years old when I was uh, finishing up. Still young, right? Mm. Yeah, but what, what, what was the question? I well, think? it was kind of a, you heard about Vince McMahon and the paralegal got him all that trouble. Oh, here, let me read this. Asked you to be her illegal, her, would you, would you say, yeah, uh, no. 
Mm. Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. What's your thoughts on all that problems that Vince got into with um, the uh, non-disclosure agreements with all the women? Oh, I don't know anything about it, tell you the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, uh, when I walked out of there, I was so disgusted. Uh, with how I, the business had changed or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But uh, yeah, in uh, the end of '88, uh, well, the whole year of '88, I was planning on leaving, mm. and uh, so I and I told Vince. I, <laughs> so when it came time for me to leave, I just went in. Told Vince, I says, well, it's time for me to leave. I said, you've been treating me like a second-class citizen. Mm. <clears throat> well, what do you mean? I said, Vince, I'm still an asset. You've been treating me like a liability. I said, fuck you. Yeah. I, 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 I said, I, I, I have the ability to get out of this business and open up my own business. Mm. You know, other than... I didn't want anything to do with the wrestling business uh, by the end of 88. I had just, I had had it up to here. How old were you at that time? Uh, I just turned 45. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And you had broken in when you were, how old were you when you first started? 28. Okay. So you had a good. Yeah. Well, I, good well, I, I started late, you know, I, I wanted to go to the Olympic Games, and uh, prior to going to the Olympic Games, I wasn't thinking about going to the WWF. Right. You right. know, I, I had a couple other opportunities uh, with some friends of mine. Uh, one owned a, a – what the hell did he own? He owned a Caterpillar uh, – uh, you know, heavy equipment. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, company, big multi, multi million dollar company. Mm. And uh, he trained at the same gym I did. He bugged me for two or three years to come to work for him. And I was doing all kinds of other shit, you know. And I said, ah, I said, I don't know. And I so finally, I almost pulled the trigger. And then I was, you know, trained for the Olympic Games at the time. And then I won the national championships and the Pan American Games and all that stuff. Mm. So I said, well, I can't pass up the Olympic Games. Right. So, yeah, I saw my buddy. His name was Gary. I says, Gary, I says, uh, I talked to a wrestling promoter in Minnesota. And I says, uh, if I wasn't going to wrestle, I de definitely would have come to work for you. Mm. And he says, God, I, he said, yeah, but how long can you wrestle? I said, well, I don't know. Some of these guys are wrestling 20, 30 years. Mm. Really? I said, yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, that you know, then, then I go to the Olympic Games, get out, go to wrestling camp with Ric Flair and the Iron Sheik and whatnot. And so, yes, yeah, yes. They had a, yeah, my, my life was kind of, I, I kind of geared it to what, what was going to, what was going to benefit Ken Patera the most. Yeah. You know, that's how I looked at life. You know, what, <laughs> where, where can I get the most bang for the dollar kind of mentality? Mm. And uh, so that's the direction I uh, I pointed my life and mm. took off. And success followed. What was it like working with Hulk Hogan? Did you hear about the fake story where Harley Ray sets Hogan's ring on fire at his gym and then asked for a job? I heard that uh, Harley had showed up. Was it in Kansas City? And... Force himself yeah. in the locker room or some shit? And do what? 
I guess Harley showed up in the. Did he show up with a gun or something in Kansas City when the WWF went there? Because he he was part owner of the Kansas City territory, correct? Same, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard a story that. Yeah, I heard a story that uh, when WWF ran or whatever, he showed up with a gun. I don't know if that's it's wrestling. I, you know, it's, I don't know anything about that, but yeah, it, it could be true. <laughs> right. That, yeah, because Harley he packed a gun. Yeah. Yeah, he he was a tough son of a bitch. You got any good Harley stories? Yeah, Har Harley was the type of guy. I I remember we were in some bar one night, and Harley totally drunk out of his mind. He stands up. And, uh, you know, Andre uh, the Giant was there, and myself, and, yeah, you know, a bunch of guys, Dick Murdoch and whatnot. Harley gets up. I have something to say. Said, okay, Harley. He says, I'm the toughest son of a bitch in here. I can outfight anybody. I can outfuck anybody. I can outdrink everybody. Uh, I can drive the car faster than anybody. <laughs> and by that time, he was so fucking drunk, he was starting to stumble and st stutter. And then he just lost communication. <laughs> 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 oh, God. He, he was a good guy. Good guy. <laughs> the other yeah. part of the question was, yeah, working with Hogan. I mean, how were the payoffs for those? What's that now? The payoffs. I heard the payoffs working with Hogan was like crazy. The paydays. Oh, uh, well, let's see. I, I worked with Hogan uh, uh, in the... Uh, when the hell did I work with him? The mid-80s or the early 80s? Early 80s. I know I wrestled, I've worked with them a hundred times in the AWA. In AWA. Christ, sometimes we go twenty straight days. Fuck. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I I don't remember. Okay. You know, just kind of a because you hear stories here. like whoever had a run with Hogan in the WWF. I mean, their paydays were like insane, right? Like ten thousand. Well, I, I remember the money was good. Yeah. 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 The like I wrestled Bruno thirty times uh, in championship matches uh, in the WWF. The money was phenomenal. Phenomenal. That was for Vince Senior, correct? Yeah. 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 I mean, we we, we wrestled uh, Madison Square Garden. We wrestled Igloo over in Pittsburgh, Boston Garden. Uh, uh, we wrestled down in uh, Baltimore, uh, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia. We wrestled all the big towns. All the big cities. Went, went around three times with them and all of them. And uh, I think it was like, it might have been closer to 40 times that I wrestled Bruno. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the last question for tonight. Another Andre question. Do you think Andre ever caught the gout with all his drinking? I don't know. That that's a good question. He might have. Right. I want to put a pass. So, you know, boy, the way he drank and ate uh, beef steak. Beef steak. <laughs> yeah, you know, so he like, didn't eat. He didn't eat a lot all the time. But boy, when he ate. Boy, he's a I, giant, I, right? I, I saw. He's eating that. I saw him eat uh, 15 uh, uh, steaks at a Korean barbecue, and those steaks were about six ounces a piece. Wow. I mean, he, he was just fucking shoveling them down. Yeah, so that's 100. Well, that would be seven, seven, eight pounds. Fuck. You know. That's so, crazy for us. You know, so his for drinking was world, daily, right? That uh, insane yeah, drinking I'll, I'll was I'll tell daily. you, guy. That legitimately won the world. Uh, no, he took second in the world eating championships. Ernie Ladd, 
Big Cat. Yeah. Big Cat. Yeah. Ernie Lab was a good friend of mine. Yeah. Ernie was six eight, weighed about three twenty. Okay. So he he liked going to these steakhouses that had the seventy two ounce steaks. Okay. Ernie, the, 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 oh fuck yeah, he he polished those things off. So is that like and, okay if you eat it your your dinner is free or whatever? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. If you could finish everything, right. So, uh, and and here that they came came along with the world championships in eating. So Ernie, I I don't remember where it was. Uh, I think it might have been in Las Vegas. Okay. So Ernie enters that thing, and he loses by one ounce. Oh, shit. You know why? Why? The guy that beat him ate all the knuckles and everything off the chicken bones. And oh. Ernie, Ernie didn't eat the knuckles off the chicken bones. Wow. You know, because they're all cartilage. Right, right, right. Yeah, that that's wow. what that's what cost him the championship. <laughs> well, Ken, uh, I want to before I have your book ready to go, Ken. I know we were talking about your book, and I could bring up a picture of it here. Oh, you got it in person there. Weight of the world. There yeah, it is. perfect. Nice. Even better. The weight of the world by Ken Patera. It's out now. Where can we get it? Yeah. Well, the Where? best way is just to uh, go to my website, KenPatera.com. KenPatera.com. Yeah, and order it off there. My uh, daughter has a little. Um, there it uh, is. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. The, you'll find a lot of interesting stories. That's kind of an autobiography uh, of my life. Uh, yeah. But it, it talks about a lot, a lot of the territories, but uh, talks about a lot of the characters in pro wrestling. Rick Flair uh, wrote the uh, forward to it. Oh, nice! Yeah, he did a nice oh, job, great. and uh, yeah, it's been selling very good. Yeah, very well. My, okay. my daughter has a mail order uh business here. Yeah. She's an uh, expert in CBD oil. Oh, oh nice. really? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, she's a, she's a kind of an amateur, uh, very educated uh, chemist. Okay. And so, so she makes her own uh, CBD uh, uh, pain bombs and oils and. That stuff works, man. The pain, CBD yeah. pain reliever. I put yeah. some on my knees, man. It works amazing. Yeah, well, amazing. Yeah, she does a good job with that, and uh, so we just, you know, tied it in with uh, PayPal mm. and uh, my website, and uh, saw the Ken Patera weight of the world. <laughs> weight of the world. Just go to kenpatera.com and pick up a copy. You can order it right from his website. Yeah. And uh, I might actually, yeah, actually, when we're done here, I might actually uh, get a copy for myself. I'm, uh, your, your stories are fascinating. And is there anything else you'd like to promote while you're on here? Any appearances or anything? Well, I have a few uh, appearances come. I've been waiting three to four months for back surgery. Okay. And they keep fucking me around, fucking me around. The assholes finally called uh, early afternoon, talked to my daughter, and said we like to uh, schedule uh, Mr. Patera for back surgery. So I said, well, shit, here I, I have uh, two, three appearances every month. Yeah. And uh, then, I, you know, I, I, I do podcasts like yours and yeah. I do a lot of them. And yeah. so anyway, uh, uh, I didn't know there's that many guys out there doing podcasts. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of you guys. I know. <laughs> yeah. I started I started during the uh, pandemic out of boredom, right? Oh, is that how you started? Like, yeah. Yeah, everything was locked down. And uh, a guy from England just said, hey, you want to start this? I had nothing to do. So yeah, and it just took off. It's a great way to promote yourself. It's a great way to connect with you know, and help other like yourself help promote your book. 
Way of the World by Ken Patera, available now. Go to KenPatera.com. Yeah, I just got a, a email from uh, Ross Hart. You know Ross? I never met him, but I know of him, yeah. Yeah, he's one of Brett's, uh, Brett Hart's uh, brothers. Yeah. He, he just bought a book. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah, my daughter mailed it out to him uh, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, so. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Ken. And uh, yes. uh, one last plug for his book. Could you bring it up? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Bring it up. And thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for uh, your time. Yeah, thank you, guys. And uh, just just want to have one last plug. Yep, here it is. Ken Patera, Weight of the World. Weight of the World. Go to KenPatera.com and order yours today. It's a great read. And uh, Ken, thank you so much for coming. And uh, good luck with everything. Okay, my friend? Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. You take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.